Welcome everyone to this IAQM webinar, Can a Low-Cost Air Quality Monitor Offer Near Reference Level Data? Today we are delighted to be joined by Bruno Bello. Bruno has been working on air quality monitoring since 2013. In 2016, he co-founded South Coast Science Limited, whose primary focus is to offer a common digital front end for electrochemical sensors and particulate monitors, together with an open infrastructure for air quality data. As always, there will be the chance for questions at the end of Bruno's presentation, so please do submit these in the Q&A option at the bottom of your screen. You can do this at any point during the presentation, and I will then ask these on your behalf later on. Um, as usual, this uh, presentation will be recorded and will be made available on the IAQM website and IES YouTube channel. Thank you so much for logging in. It's great to see so many of you here today. Um, and Bruno, thanks very much, and hand, I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, so this is, I think, a relevant question. We understand the advantages of low cost equipment, not just the cost, but the ability to deploy um, a reference station uh, costs a lot of money, but it also takes a lot of space and it takes a lot of people's time to maintain it in such a way that it delivers reference quality data. But the inhibition on air quality on, on low cost sensors uh, comes from um, a lack of data quality and a lack of trust. Let's see what the prospects are for changing that. The big red box at the bottom of the picture is a reference station. The little white box attached to the cage on the top um, beside the ladder is a low cost sensor device manufactured by South Coast Science. So here's the question, could this little white box possibly provide comparable data quality to the reference site? The two sorts of environmental sensors that we use here, electrochemical gas, electrochemical sensors, um, these sense reactive gases, um, NO, NO2, uh, carbon monoxide, uh, sulfur dioxide, hydrogen sulfide, and a few others. And there's one right here. Um, this is the one we use. It's manufactured by AlphaSense. AlphaSense, the sensor manufacturers, <coughs> are also the founding investors of South Coast Science. So since 2016, we've had a really interesting relationship where we do electronics and software and data systems, and they do the science and the sensors. Um, we also use AlphaSense uh, optical particle counters, and there's one buried in the middle of this um, device that Sedco Science also makes. Obviously, these are two entirely different sorts of sensor, but some of the problems that they throw up in terms of interpreting their output uh, effectively are really quite similar. You know, I should say that um, it says here CO2 and VOC is not problematic. The change in environment as it impacts on um, the signal from the sensors is much less of an issue for CO2 and VOCs. And I would also say that at the start of our work, we weren't even looking for near reference. We were just trying to make something that was practical, that worked, that provides something and that was useful to people. Going to the um, uh, European Commission uh, specifications, um, we drill down into data quality objectives um, for reference or equivalent reference uh, equipment. And there's a link there, I hope you get slides, um, but you can uh, Google this stuff. This table is interesting, which comes from this document in, in two ways. It has an expanded uncertainty, and we have to think about how that's calculated. 
Um, and um, we also have uh, reference methods. We're not very surprised to see that um, gas electrochemical sensors are not considered uh, candidate reference um, uh, methods uh, for, for uh, sensing gases, and maybe that will change. Before looking at um, data interpretation, we do have to uphold the, the garbage in, garbage out principle. Uh, all errors are cumulative. Um, there are um, uh, some tricks involved in building um, circuitry to, in this case, read uh, the signal from gas electrochemical electrodes. And we actually started by going to environmental scientists and saying, what is your, what sampling rate do you want? And then for example, building uh, low pass filters that accommodated that and no more. One thing we learned uh, quite quickly and very much the hard way is that how you build the device has a gigantic impact on the data quality. In particular, electrochemical sensors are very sensitive to uh, radio interference. Um, and unfortunately, particularly at uh, mobile signal frequencies. So a great deal of experimentation went into designing an enclosure uh, that protected them, but let them breathe at the same time. The other issue was um, deployability and robustness in the field. The Praxis Urban you see here was designed in conversation with the United Nations Environment Programme and their headquarters in Nairobi. So from the very beginning, we were looking at deploying in meteorologically harsh environments uh, in very hot, very cold um, conditions. And also uh, conditions um, that were not favorable in other ways like rolling blackouts and um, occasional, often long lasting uh, loss in uh, communications, whether that was ethernet or um, 4G uh, cellular. Um, so we built a device that um, attempted to be always connected and supply data in real time, um, but could equally well work um, in occasionally connected situations. And behind that was a fairly substantial data infrastructure. Uh, the data infrastructure essentially has to be 100% available. Particularly when you're using MQTT messaging, uh, most uh, messaging protocols, um, if the uh, basic data consumer that subscribes to all the messages on all the topics of all the devices in the world um, if it's not 100% available, you lose data. We've created something which effectively is 100% available. Uh, we haven't lost a single message um, for about three years, and then only because we were doing a very early experiments. And the reason for this, uh, this robustness is obviously because it's good for the customer, but also because of a really fundamental principle, we think that doing data interpretation, understanding how it's to be done is something you do in the field. It's not something you do in the lab. So here we have Sean Kahn of the United Nations who's spent most of his time in an air-conditioned office in Nairobi, uh, up a ladder on top of a school in Addis Ababa. And we deployed a device there uh, with a surprisingly unreliable data connection. Um, which ultimately worked fine. By being in the field, we could learn what the issues were, and I'll show you some graphs very shortly. This was one of our earliest um, uh, field deployments to, to a third party. Uh, this place is called the Chigwell Orchard. It's in rural Essex. And it serves uh, a very useful function for environmental scientists. 
essentially it provides information on the background level of air pollution. Um, so for example, you have a prevailing southwesterly wind, which will be blowing from London and you will have no or almost no local pollution sources. So if you want to know what the pollution level is in uh, Colchester um, and how much of that is locally produced, you also need to take readings here and subtract one from the other. So we deployed here and uh, this is a very challenging environment and partly because we're looking at very low pollution levels. So percentage errors are very significant. And secondly, because this being an orchard, well, it's not particularly clear from this picture, there are a lot of trees. And on a hot August day, you can have downpours and humidity levels become extremely high very quickly. And we discovered here that, in fact, although we built a device that was reliable in the field and kept delivering data, we had actually built the world's most expensive humidity meter. We had a lot of data interpretation work to do. So a timeline of what's, what's been happening. We started building what were essentially reference uh, circuit boards that could plug onto Raspberry Pis and Beagle Bones and do things in the lab and show that we were competent uh, to doing analog digital conversion from electrochems. Then we built things that worked in the field and by working in the field, we found what the problems were. At that time, AlphaSense was working or had its own project to do data interpretation for um, gas electrochems and do it properly. Um, came, people at Cambridge were also working on OPC data. In the end, uh, in desperation, we gave up um, waiting to be told how to do it right and tried it ourselves. There are two kind of fundamental pillars to, to this type of work. And here's one of them. What this shows from the laboratory, in fact, from AlphaSense, that gas electrochemical sensors have an excellent linear response to gas concentrations, so long as the conditions are, uh, are right and don't vary. There's no environmental change other than gas concentration. So that linearity is useful. This shows a tiny bit of data from a long running experiment we did where we took two Praxis Urban devices and mounted them side by side, in fact, in a reference state, co-located with a reference station. And what we discovered was that um, the uh, signal from, in this case, NO2 gas sensors is very repeatable. So you can take any two NO2 sensors and put them beside each other and they will always give you the same answer. The answer will a lot of the time be wrong, but it'll always be wrong in exactly the same way. So with those two things, the reproducibility and um, the fact that under the right conditions, things were linear, uh, meant it was worth continuing this sort of research. This is some data from Addis Ababa from that machine in the photograph. And here we have SO2 varying with, well, it's varying with SO2 concentrations uh, because of uh, badly refined petrol in cars and the traffic pollution in Addis Ababa is appalling. But it's also, as you can see quite clearly here, it's varying with some combination of temperature and humidity. And it's quite difficult just looking at this to untangle it. This is a kind of fun one. This was in Dakar in Senegal. Um, and this chart comes from a time before a Praxis Urban device was deployed in the field and it was sitting in uh, the offices of um, the environmental monitoring people. Um, and they have a particular sort of air conditioning system that cycles every 15 minutes or so. And here you see the 
um, SO2 signal cycling alongside the change in humidity. Some people have speculated that this is a kind of transient response, but we think it's more subtle than that. Having kind of screwed up our eyes and studied this, we started doing some modeling. This is um, an approach I'd call a physics approach. And what I mean by that is that we start with some simple model, some speculative model, a hypothesis, based on what we think we know about the equipment. So it's understandable and you can calculate with it. And um, it allows you to do experiments. It, in this case, is here trying to predict what the error would be based on temperature and humidity. And then you see if the prediction is right by subtracting the predicted error from the signal um, using co-located data. So we had a number of devices uh, co-located uh, at uh, reference sites in the UK run by um, Ricardo Energy and Environment and some particular sensor uh, reference sites run by the UN. We did particular work with um, Ricardo also. This particular model is very, very simple. We didn't think it'd be as simple as this, but it makes quite a pretty picture. And what it says is, um, temperature response varies with humidity. So at very low humidity, the temperature response is very strong and at very high humidity, the temperature response isn't so strong. It's a very simple physics model and produces a surface within a three dimensional space where X axis is temperature, Y axis is humidity and Z axis is error. Here's another physics model, and this one is um, for PM1, PM2.5, and PM10 output from the AlphaSense OPC N3 uh, device, which uses a laser shone through a moving column of air and reflects off a mirror. And based on that, you can work out the speed of motion of particles and the size distribution. Um, but of course, you may also be measuring water droplets and so on and misidentifying those. So here we see that error changes with um, humidity uh, and the Y scale here, it goes from naught to seven. These are, uh, this is a geometric error. So the, the top of the graph is seven times over reading. Um, at the 10% humidity at the bottom, it's under reading by about 80%. We got encouraging results from that work. The error models that we produced were much better than nothing. But we felt there was further to go and none of us were such great mathematicians that we wanted to carry on with, if you like, with manual methods. So perhaps out of laziness or lack of education, we moved to a machine learning project. I went to see a, a machine learning expert at Amazon Web Services, and she told me two things, both of which were important and true. Data quality is more important than data volume. And the key term uh, in your model will be something you didn't expect. By data quality, in this case, we mean a wide range of values. So you want a data set, a training data set, which covers a wide range of humidity and wide range of gas concentrations or particulate densities. What's the key term? Well, for different types of sensors, it's going to be something different, but at least you need, you need an environment where you can build uh, training sets really quickly and try out ideas, um, do experiments on a grand scale. So we had many months by this time 
we had about a year of collocation data. Um, so we were recording in data every 10 seconds in three different UK locations for over a year. And that certainly gave us data volume. Um, in recent times, uh, particularly at the UK, at London airports, where we're monitoring um, pollution levels have been a little bit low. So these were the results from the, the, the physics work. And um, on the left, you have the output as presented by the firmware on the AlphaSense OPC N3. So it's got a way of calculating um, PM values, standardized PM values, um, uh, using a tiny little bit of software. So it's not gonna be doing anything terribly complicated. And what you see here is a disappointing spread of values, but you also see something else, which is this V shape. And the V shape suggests it's got two vertices, um, uh, that there are different processes at work here. And when we applied the, the, the simple physics model, it shepherded, you see the output on the right, it shepherded the values into a more useful space, but it hadn't identified what these two processes were. Um, so something, the, the something that was wrong was as wrong as before, it's just the points were pulled together better. This is the output from the machine learning model. Yes, it really is that good, but hang on. What we did, what I did here was take a big data set, split off 20% of it, set it aside, build a model based on the 80%, and then test it against the 20% the we set aside. And this is the output. It's spectacularly good, and that's not a bad starting point, but bear in mind that the 20% that was being used was data from the same OPC devices and in the same environmental conditions because those 20% of values were pulled at random from the data set. As you move towards changes in the environment where you're testing, this will spread out a little bit. And this is an example of it. So here, we're deliberately running the uh, model against a data set from a very different environment. And its ability to predict is still pretty good, but it's not as good as it was. But here's the scale of the problem. So here we have the blue line, which is um, a reference output uh, in fact, from a palace feed us. Um, the orange line, which was a physics model, which really isn't too bad, and the green, which is the output from the OPC itself. Uh, so many times over reading and actually correcting errors that big is arithmetically quite tricky. You need lots of decimal places in your scaling factors. For NO2, this is um, output from uh, a machine learning model. And um, it, the, these scatter charts, this particular scatter chart looks a little bit fatter than you might like, but of course the scatter chart doesn't tell you how many points are layered at each location. So it's better, it's more appropriate at this point to look at a histogram. And in this particular case, um, under similar sort of test arrangements, uh, you get a second sigma of six parts per billion, which is really quite good. Moving from there to uh, expanded uncertainty, we're not gonna go through the maths, fortunately, of this, but there are standard ways of approaching this. I think this spreadsheet may actually be, this is an Excel spreadsheet that's coded to perform certain, um, a certain form of interpretation on what's going on. And this, uh, here are some charts 
um, from uh, part of the MSERT certification process that we're completing uh, for PM 2.5 and PM 10. And I'll explain what new algorithm and new period are all about. We, we started doing running these tests at the National Physical Laboratory in Teddington in London um, in the autumn. And um, at uh, round about uh, Guy Fawkes night, fireworks night, um, London was very foggy and a proper smog on fireworks night, which I think was a Thursday, and then on Friday and Saturday emerged. And that gave conditions that the model hadn't seen. So um, we uh, stood back from it and decided to create a new model using fireworks night data that week, data and some other weeks around it, uh, it were included in the model. And that's what's called the new algorithm. But then we continued to run it. So we, we ended that phase of MSERT testing and began the MSERT certification process again, test process again. So this is the new algorithm of the new period uh, for PM 2.5. Incidentally, PM 1 is the easiest to compute uh, accurately. PM 10 is the hardest, essentially, because PM 10 particles look more like uh, water droplets. Um, so this is um, uh, PM 10, as I say, it's not quite as good. Um, the expanded uncertainty here is well within what's required for indicative, um, but slightly outside of what would be required for uh, reference equivalence. Um, this was just looking at it for a slightly different data set. And here's, a, here's the kind of fun one because um, we applied the new algorithm that, which included the fireworks and like data um, to the whole of the old period through the autumn. And again, it's showing us that where the model is running on a data range that it's already experienced, it's super good. Um, and otherwise it starts slipping. But the bigger the data set you get, the more, the higher the probability that the model's already experienced that. And I liken it to the idea of building a self-driving car by collecting data from every car in the world continuously until you eventually got a, a model uh, which includes driving on every road in the world in every driving condition and every meteorological condition and so on. Um, the, the limit being in this particular case here that um, these gigantic errors, um, scaling errors that the OPC produces um, uh, really hit the limit of, of, of what you can compute. So that remains a question. Will, are the OPCs sufficiently uniform in their performance um, and their response to particular environmental conditions? Certainly lining up a bunch of OPC N3s, they do perform um, exceptionally consistently. And, and those models were built, in fact, from data from multiple devices mashed together. And we just point out, we think that equivalence is partly about data quality, but it's also about trust. People have to believe that, um, that the, the, the claims you're making about this device are true. And they continue to be true throughout the, the working life of the sensors and the device. MSERTS is one part of that. I, I favor also a, a, an open reference platform where different vendors could uh, install equipment and make it publicly available so that we can see day by day, um, month by month, uh, how they perform against a, a well-managed reference site. But there's lots of discussions we can have about that. In summary, we we will continue to move towards equivalence, and I think it's potentially achievable reference equivalence. Um, 
both for electrochemical sensors and for um, and for uh, optical particle counters. Um, but let's wait and see. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you, Bruno, for that really interesting presentation. Um, really great to see all of those data sources there. Um, all attendees, if you have any questions, please do put them in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Um, I've got a few that have come through the chat function, so I'm just going to dive right into those, Bruno, if that works for you. Yeah. Um, so firstly, uh, the US EPA have reported that several NO2 electrochemical sensors show sudden drift changes in their baseline. Is this something that you've seen? Uh, and have you been able to explain this artifact and come up with a solution? That's a really good question, and that is a really live issue. Um, this is a question that we're reviewing, and it will take time because a lot of the drift phenomenon simply happen over very long periods of time, like maybe six months or a year. Um, one issue might be that, in fact, it factors out from, from good modeling that if you collect data uh, over a sufficiently wide um, environmental range, which, which might be something like, you know, the UK from a cold winter through a hot summer and back again. Um, it might be that the, the drift actually factors out, that the model is correcting for that drift. Um, we shall see. Um, I suspect if there is a fundamental drift, and it has to do with, for example, the age of the sensor, it might be very small. So I think the most likely outcome is part of that drift will be removed through good modeling. And a little bit of that drift may remain, but it's gonna take quite a long time to be absolutely sure about that. Great, thank you, that makes sense. Um, and I guess this is a little bit related, um, a follow-up question. Um, is the aim to, of this technology to get the right answers or is, it, is the aim just to be similar enough to reference mod methods, um, which obviously have their own issues as well? The right answer, hmm. That, that, um, um, what, if you, if you are using a particular reference technique, what, and you're building models based on, collocation data, what the model is doing is mimicking what that reference equipment is doing. Is that the right answer? I, I, think, I think in terms of gas concentration, it probably is. I think in terms of particulates, different reference techniques will give you different answers. And you will, you will to do modeling, you have to use the same technique across all your collocations, the same reference technique. Uh, otherwise, things will get very confused. Um, so, yeah, for gases, yeah, this is going to be close to the right answer. Um, uh, uh, what was it Harrison Ford said in Raiders of the Last Ark when he's teaching archaeology? He says, Archaeology is about facts. If you're interested in the truth, the philosophy department's upstairs. Good answer, thank you. <laughs> um, I'll move on to the next question. Um, and this is, does this technology also have an internal application? Um, and I assume this is uh, looking at indoor air quality. Yes. Um, we are actually working on an IAQ, really high quality IAQ device based on all the same technologies. The communications technologies will be a little bit different. The way it's packaged and presented and so on is different. The types of data infrastructure are different because there are established ways of doing, for example, building, monitoring and maintenance and so on. Um, the, the, the IAQ challenge is actually about price more than anything else because things like well building standard want a lot of different phenomena monitored. And it's 
just part of the IAQ thing that you're going to need quite a lot of devices. Uh, you might get away with one per floor, but it might be more than that. And then if you're the shard, that's quite a lot of boxes. Great, thank you. Um, a, a really quick question here is your MSERTS data, um, is that 24 hour averages? Uh, oh, good question. It was, uh, I believe it was one hour averages and 24 hour averages. But I think those charts were, I think maybe one of them was one, was 24. I think they were all one, one hour ones. Great, thank you. Um, I'll move on to the next one. We've got quite a lot of questions coming in, which is great. Um, as you refine your algorithm to get a good fit between co-located reference instruments and your own equipment, how will you determine when your instrument can be relied upon without being co-located? Um, well, in a sense, it would have to be co-located for you to know whether it was wrong. Um, that, that's pretty straightforward. As, what, what we've tended to do is build models based on data from multiple devices. So we'll take, say, three sites in the UK, collect all the co-location data and all the um, electrochem data and align them properly and merge them and randomize them and build models like that because we find so much consistency between the sensors. For the OPCs, the they're just built in a very and calibrated in a very consistent way. For the electrochems, it's harder because Alpha Sense calibrate each sensor individually, and you have to bring that calibration data into the model somehow. Um, but then, what you do is you apply it to another device that you might have collocated for a while, and if consistently that does the correction, then yeah, you're good to go. Um, AlphaSense, we have found, are good at, first of all, making OPCs consistently and calibrating electrochems consistently. Great, thank you. Um, DC sensors uh, often get interference from other gases. Um, if a potential interference gas is not known, how can you compensate for this? Uh, you couldn't if you didn't know. Uh, Alpha, Spence, Alpha Sense spends a lot of time in the lab measuring uh, cross sensitivity because they can expose individual sensors to very precisely known gas concentrations and see what happens. We, we live with the fact that their ozone sensor is highly sensitive to NO2, but we haven't nailed down any other big cross sensitivities. There might be one of SO2 to VOCs, but I think that the, the prevailing view is that um, uh, it's just because VOCs and SO2 tend to exist in the same place. Um, uh, we provide equipment and spend a lot of time talking to someone called Jada Roberts, who's a volcanologist, and uh, she assures us at the sorts of concentrations that volcanologists see of things like SO2, there there are major um, cross sensitivities emerge, but at typical street level concentrations, they don't. Maybe you're rash of me to say that, but I'm saying it. I should mention here actually, Chiara Roberts once did a webinar for us. The oh, IEFM is also available. Um, on our, on our website, if anyone's interested in hearing a bit more about that particular um, kind of case study. Thanks, Bruno. Um, so on to the next question. Um, they've said uh, that to paraphrase a comment from earlier in your presentation, you indicated that any two electrochemical NO2 sensors would give the same outputs. Could you expand on this? Um, they're saying that this could be challenged and or, or they might have misunderstood. Um, how, how is it that you can get the same result? Um, you get the same result because they were properly calibrated and they retain their calibration for a certain period of time, let's say two years. And in fact, if they lose their calibration, they change in their behavior, they will do so consistently. So your two sensors, as I say, will be wrong, but they'll be wrong in a consistent way. That's what we found. 
Uh, that's that's an important point. We're not claiming that they're always great. It's just that they're always consistent, which is something quite different. OK, thank you. Um, uh, the next question is, um, and attendees used similar equipment, um, which couldn't be calibrated apart from when in the lab. Um, so there is no way there is no way to know how to apply drift or calibration factors to one's data apart from to assume linear between start and end calibration results. Do you have any comment on this? Yeah, I mean, this is a really, really hard problem because you can calibrate, we know this, you can calibrate something in the lab and put it in the field and immediately it starts going wrong because the environment's different. Um, likewise, for example, people have attempted to calibrate devices in the field by having some portable gassing equipment and attaching some gas hood to the device and exposing it to very precisely known concentrations and calibrating it that way. And that doesn't work either because that bottled gas is a different temperature and humidity to, to, to the wider environment. And the way you solve the problem is that you just study the behavior of lots of sensors in the environment for long periods of time and you find out what the environmental factors are. And if you get that right, then you can calibrate in the lab, for example, and take it into the field, and it should be the same. And the indications we have at this stage are good. I mean, for, for PMs, we know we're good now, but for gases, we're still treading softly. Um, but I mean, that's that's what you do. You you calibrate the model output, not the sensor output. And I should say you have to do it for a particular design of device. So the model is very sensitive to tiny changes in temperature and humidity at different parts of the system. Um, so if you were to change the design of your device, you would build another model to co-locate all over again. Great, thank you. Um, are you doing any baseline correction for ozone and sulfur dioxide? We will be. Um, they're high on our list. Uh, SO2 has been, it's been hard to get good SO2 data. We've had about six months of co-location uh, beside Grangemouth Refinery in central Scotland. So now we've got some good data and we'll, we'll try modelling with that. Um, again, it's about data quality. The modelling techniques we use at the moment are not good at extrapolation. And we may have to apply some different techniques there. So, for example, although we've got some nice SO2 spikes in Grangemouth, if the model is exposed to ranges outside of those it's experienced, it might have, might have a problem with them. We'll find out. Great, thank you. Um, just time for one quick question um, before, before we close up. Um, you mentioned, of course, uh, low cost sensors. Um, so what are the approximate costs per unit? This type of technology? Um, the uh, practice urban with um, uh, four gases and the OPC in it is in the order of four thousand pounds. So that may be a different meaning of low cost, but and obviously we're looking for much lower costs for an internal air quality device. But these aren't consumer products. Right. And the cost okay, is well, also, the cost I should say is also to do with maintenance. So if you can make something you attach to a lamppost and you can leave it for two years without touching it, there's an element of cost saving in, in that arrangement too. Great. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Bruno, for that really interesting presentation. Um, we've had loads of questions through. I'm really sorry if I didn't make it to yours. Um, I'm afraid that we are out of time. Um, as I mentioned, this, is, this has been recorded and will be uploaded to our YouTube channel within the month. Um, so thank you attendees for logging in. I hope you found this beneficial and informative. Um, if you're a member, please don't forget to record your attendance on the IES CPD tool. Um, the next IAQM event is on the 22nd of June, uh, and this is a virtual forum exploring the implications of the world's first air pollution death certificate and will feature expert speakers involved in the landmark inquest. Um, this will include perspectives from the lawyer, physician, and air quality specialist involved in the case. Um, so please do register for this on the IAQM website. Um, 
And finally, thank you so much, Bruno. Uh, that was a really great presentation. Um, I hope to see you again soon. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thank you.